This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I want to thank the uh, conference organizers and the conference sponsors, and thank you for coming out tonight. I, I hope what I have to share will be of interest to you. Um, so without further ado, you can see the uh, nice building where we work on campus at the university. Uh, very fortunate to have that building, uh, which was uh, constructed a couple years ago. So we're very thankful for that. Um, so what I thought I would do is kind of give you a big picture outline of the talk, and then we'll go delve deeper into each of these areas. Um, so thank you for the nice introduction, which talked about a lot of my background. What today's talk will focus on will be a lot. First of all, can everybody hear me in the back? OK, good. Louder. If, if you want me to go louder, just kind of raise your hand periodically. I'll try my best to, to express it all the time. <laughs> but it requires a lot of energy, but I'll do it. Uh, OK, so for the, for the talk, um, the first topic will relate to why chronic low-grade inflammation is important to us as humans and why it's particularly relevant to aging processes. Um, and we're going to distinguish that from acute inflammation, which is your body's way of healing itself when you're injured or having an infection. Okay? Uh, then we'll talk about some of the causes of inflammation, and then we'll go into the potential interventions, some key scientific findings at our institute, and then for tonight, for the first time, I'm going to talk about three areas of research that I've been working on for the past couple years that I haven't ever presented before, and they're summarizing reviews of the literature, so that will be at the very end. Um, and I hope that you'll find that helpful. The simpler version of this is the first half of the talk is going to talk about problems, and the second half is going to talk about potential solutions. Okay. Um, and again, just keep reminding me. Okay. <laughs> So on a big picture level, people always say, well, what the heck is aging? And of course, I can't give you the perfect definition, but I want to talk about the way we look at what aging is. And, and that's simply loss of function over time. And by that, we're talking about, about unhealthy aging, because we all want to maintain function for as long as possible. And of course, it's always an interaction between a genetic background with environmental factors, nutrition, exercise, other lifestyle factors, and how these are constantly interacting to ultimately influence uh, rates of aging and uh, diseases associated with aging. Okay. Uh, what we see, it's not a surprise, but over time, both cognitive and physical performance decline uh, and increase the risk of both cognitive and physical disability. Is it still on? OK. Uh, of course, the etiology or the causes of this decline are complex to understand. There's a, a number of factors at, at, at play. Uh, here I list some of the key ones. These are, this is not an exhaustive list, but some of the key factors that we know play a role are a reduction in blood flow or circulation, reduction in cardiovascular function, uh, chronic inflammation, which we're going to focus on, oxidative stress. How many people have heard the term oxidative stress? All right, okay. So, so it's what it means, essentially, you can think about your own body when you overexert yourself, and then you have to try to recover after you've either gone a long period of time exercising or engaged in a certain task. Somehow you have to recover. Well, your cells are also under a similar process. So if you expose them to stress over time, that can lead to them becoming damaged. Now, when you're younger, your ability to defend against stresses is higher. And so what happens if your ability to defend your cells against stress is compromised or, or inhibited for some reason, and the stress becomes prolonged, the cells can be called under oxidative stress. And it's one of the mechanisms whereby we believe the aging process can uh, take place or can accelerate the aging process. And I'll talk about the connection between oxidative stress and inflammation shortly. 
Uh, and last but not least, metabolic dysfunction, which we're going to focus on as well. Okay. All right. Um, just as a point, which probably most everybody is aware, uh, what we see here in this curve is that the, the chronic diseases that are so prevalent in our society are clearly increased with aging. Uh, so, uh, so if you were to take what's the number one risk factor for these diseases, the, the age is the number one risk factor, okay? And so that's just kind of the point here. Um, now, why? Why is age one of the number one risk factors, or the number one risk factor? What you see with aging, as I've kind of alluded to a few times, is that levels of chronic inflammation in the blood are increasing. And this appears to be directly related to a number of disease conditions. Here I list many of the conditions that have been shown to be associated with chronic inflammation. Uh, I won't read them to you, but you can just see there, there are quite a few, and many of today's chronic diseases are pretty clearly related. Uh, what, this is a, a finding of an important study that was published in the journal Circulation in 2002. And this is kind of what, what got people recognizing the role, or potential role, that inflammation could have, uh, not the only study, but a, a very pivotal one, pivotal one, to show that uh, there was this direct connection between elevated levels of uh, this inflammatory cytokine called C-reactive protein. How many people have heard of C-reactive protein? Most everybody, okay. Uh, and years of survival, uh, cardiovascular disease-free survival. They, they essentially followed otherwise healthy women, 15,000 of them, and looked at whether there was a connection between levels of this inflammatory cytokine and years of cardio, um, CVD event-free survival. And they showed there was a clear connection and at a similar level as the connection between LDL, low-density lipoprotein, which has, was an established risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So that got the world recognizing, in, in large part, that we need to be paying attention to these markers of inflammation. Okay, so that was one of the big studies I wanted to highlight. Another um, study was done uh, in the cohort called, uh, called the Healthy Aging and Body Composition Study. And this study essentially looked at almost 3,000 men and women uh, between the ages of 70 to 79. So they were otherwise healthy. They were, uh, did not have a disability at the time of enrollment. And they followed these individuals for uh, 30 months. And what they looked at was they evaluated those individuals who became disabled during that time period. And the way they defined disabled was inability to walk a block, OK? So over the course of 30 months, a certain percentage did become disabled. And, but what's most relevant to, to our um, purpose here is that there was a clear connection between the inflammatory elevations of the inflammatory cytokine C-reactive protein, which almost everybody's heard about, and IL-6. You can see those who did develop disability had higher levels for both of these inflammatory markers. Now, how many people have heard of IL-6? Less. It's less well known, but in, in the scientific literature, it's, um, it's discussed quite a bit. So I may refer to these two. These are the two that are um, most widely discussed to date. Okay. Um, all right. So kind of taking a step back and saying, OK, there is this increase in levels of inflammation in the blood as we age. Why and what are some of the sources of this increase? Okay. Now, the, there's multiple sources. There's um, genetic and epigenetic factors, which are somewhat out of our control. Um, but then let's talk about some of the more the factors that may be more under our control. So the exogenous factors include things like smoking, air pollution, alcohol intake, uh, level of burden due to infection, and of course, dietary intake. Okay. And then there's endogenous factors. I won't go through a lot of these. I'll, I'll mention them. But we're going to talk a little bit more about adiposity, or body, body fat, uh, and its potential role 
and then subclinical disease burden, as well as oxidative stress state, which we talked a little bit about. Okay. And so then this is kind of just talking about the pathways through which these factors may ultimately lead to this condition of sarcopenia loss of uh, function. How many people have heard of sarcopenia? Okay, so loss of muscle with aging. This, when I've asked this in the past couple years, very few. So this term has now become much more mainstream, and, and that's important. Um, you can see the potential mechanisms by which these factors, endogenous factors, may indirectly related, be related to chronic disease states, uh, including our most prevalent disease conditions, and ultimately result in mobility limitation or disability. Okay. Um, so that's kind of a big picture. What are the factors? I can't go into lots of details about each of these for this purpose, but I wanted to kind of just talk about these factors. Now, you might say, well, why is, are, is it increased with aging? Why is inflammation increased with aging? We'll start to talk about the endogenous changes that may occur over time shortly. And one of those, um, as, as we mentioned, uh, sarcopenia, well, how, how, this is, a, by the way, a, a figure that was published uh, with a colleague, Tom Buford, in uh, 2010, where, where we kind of tried to conceptualize what are the driving factors in this condition of sarcopenia, because um, for many years that was the focus of our Institute on Aging. And so um, this figure, I think, was very helpful. Uh, of course, we highlight here uh, these pro-inflammatory cytokines, so pro-inflammatory molecules. And again, when they're chronically elevated, they can lead to what's called um, cellular stress and lead to ultimately cells to no longer survive in, in a condition called apoptosis. So that means cell death, okay? Um, I, I won't, I'll try to minimize the words like that. Um, but ultimately, <laughs> Ultimately, that can um, affect our ability to regenerate and lead to a reduction in protein synthesis and lead to sarcopenia. So I hope that's helpful on a relatively quick overview of a big picture level for sarcopenia. Now on a maybe, oops, sorry. So what happens though to the muscle as we age? Um, as we've talked about enough here. But what, what's interesting is there's a small, if any, reduction in specific force. So if you just need to go in a certain plane, there's less of a clear reduction. But what can happen over time is that there's an infiltration of fat into the muscle bundles, so the muscle tissue is no longer as high quality. And so that can lead to an increase in fatigability. So, um, and over time, that can affect a person's metabolic rate which is something that you've probably heard about. Uh, and typically, you start to see a, a marked reduction in metabolic rate after the age of 50. Uh, and that reduction frequently parallels the loss of muscle mass that occurs with aging. Okay? So let's go into wh why does body fat make a difference here? Uh, and why is that potentially impairing the function of the muscle? Well, up until, you know, maybe 10 years ago, people thought fat was in, in, in our organ. It just was there. But now we know that body adipose tissue is a very active secretory organ. So it's secreting um, a number of factors, including hormones. Here's our big one, inflammatory cytokines other hormonal factors and complement factors, steroids, free fatty acids, et cetera. So with this um, tissue infiltrating the muscle, it can start to impair the function of the muscle over time, okay? Uh, if you couple that knowledge with what we see in our world today, what, we, what do we see? We unfortunately see that the epidemic of obesity has continued to increase over time. Now, somewhat good news is that only recently has this curve started to flatten a little bit, but it's certainly not decelerating or has not decelerated yet. And more noteworthy for our talk is the fact that the steepest slope in terms of rate of increase in body weight and prevalence of obesity was among individuals between the ages of 60 to 74 
as compared to middle age and, and younger adults, okay? Um, and I know, like I said, the first part of the talk is about the problem. Then we're going to get into potential solutions. Okay. Um, okay, so I know that that was kind of somewhat depressing, and, and this is the slide. <laughs> And, and I'm prefacing this because this is the slide that I almost feel is the most depressing, so I try to, try to build up to that. Um, what unfortunately happens to everybody to, known to date alive is that over time, um, your body composition changes, regardless of whether you fall into the category of obese or overweight. What unfortunately tends to happen is that the proportion of um, muscle tissue or lean tissue um, declines. This is the blue, I'm sorry. The blue declines and the proportion of adipose tissue or body fat increases. So what you have here is a hypothetical example of a man or me when I was 25. And you can see this is my body composition and my, my body weight hasn't changed at the age of 70 now and my height hasn't changed. But my body composition has certainly changed such that the proportion of body fat or adipose tissue is more than double, and the uh, lean tissue has decreased significantly. Unfortunately, that appears to occur. We're going to talk about potential ways to slow that process shortly. Um, and then, if you couple what I just said with a poor diet, physical inactivity, and stress, I don't, does anybody in here have stress? <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Uh, so we all have, of, of course, stress, and, and many, many of us have a, a job or a life that doesn't encourage physical activity the way it used to. And so we almost have to really make plans to choose to be active nowadays. And then if you couple that with a, a diet that's, uh, I don't probably have to tell you, that's poor in terms of high calorie, high um, sugar, high bad fat quantity food frequently available at a low price, it, it, it's no surprise that many individuals are um, gaining weight, an unhealthy weight. And then over time though, that can lead, that can have true metabolic effects, including infl increasing blood pressure, leading to a pro-inflammatory state, which we mentioned, insulin resistance, and then this dyslipidemia, which marked by high triglycerides, low um, HDL, and high small, low-density lipoprotein particles, which incidentally are the ones that are most associated with cardiovascular disease, okay? And so it's no surprise that what, we, what can develop is something called the metabolic syndrome. How many people have heard of the metabolic syndrome? Most everybody, okay. And in general, there's different definitions, but this is the, the key characteristics. In general, if an individual has three or more of these characteristics, they're determined to have the metabolic syndrome, okay? And, and these are abdominal obesity, hyperinsulinemia, high fasting blood glucose, or impaired glucose tolerance, uh, high triglycerides, low HDL, and or hypertension. So if you have three or more, they would, uh, the doctor would say you have metabolic syndrome. You might say, okay, um, now so what? So let's talk about that. Um, so, first off, I want to point out that this, I think this slide tells the story pretty clearly, but what we see here is in both men and women, what happens to the prevalence of the metabolic syndrome with age? Well, we go from a relatively very low prevalence in the 20s to now more than double when individuals are in their 30s, to then another nice big jump when individuals are in their 40s, to then another jump when individuals are in their 50s, to then when individuals are in the 60s, almost half of individuals 60 or older would have what's called the metabolic, the metabolic syndrome based on what I just talked about. Now, okay, now why is that important? It's important because studies have found that the metabolic syndromes increased, uh, directly associated with increased risk of all-cause mortality. So that means mortality for any, from any cause. Individuals with versus without the metabolic syndrome, there's a, a five-fold increase in all-cause mortality. Also, cardiovascular mortality. You can see with versus without the metabolic syndrome, there's a clear distinction in, in terms of risk. 
Um, and we can talk, start to talk about the mechanisms next, uh, briefly. Um, and, and in this slide, so wh why, why would the metabolic syndrome be associated with this risk of mortality? And, and with aging, why is it going up? Well, with, over time, what can happen if we saturate our lipid storage capacity, but continue to engage in lifestyle behaviors marked by high calorie intake and sedentary lifestyle, high stress, the lipids have to go somewhere, okay? Uh, and, and what happens is they start to surround the muscle, infiltrate the muscle, as we talked about briefly, the vital organs such as the liver and the heart. And that can create a, a, a state of lipotoxicity. Again, why, why is it important? Because these um, lipid tissues are actively secreting many compounds, including inflammatory cytokines. So if you just think about your muscles constantly under stress due to these uh, sur being surrounded by excessive lipids. Um, and what the literature has shown is that, as I alluded to earlier, that there's two causes of, at a cellular level that's generally well accepted. Of course, there's always debate about what the true cause of aging is, but, but the um, majority of scientists uh, you know, have a, the belief that oxidative stress and inflammation play an important role in the aging process, okay? And so um, what we see is uh, accumulating evidence that supports these molecular, this uh, hypothesis of molecular inflammation underlying aging processes. And just here's some of the reviews articles related to that. Uh, and then kind of just to highlight that, um, this, this is a summary of many findings, and, and what you see is on, on the left are different molecules in the body, ranging from redox molecules, or molecules that modulate your, um, your state of oxidative stress, if you will, pro-inflammatory enzymes, pro-inflammatory cytokines, adhesion molecules, NF-kappa B, or inflammatory cascade activating molecules, you don't need to know the names of these molecules. The most important thing here is the inflammatory process and the aging process. You can see that they go hand in hand, that all of the same molecules that are, are going up with aging are also going up with inflammatory processes. You can see on the next, the, I we mentioned that with calorie restriction, these same molecules are blunted from being overexpressed. And I won't talk about the last part right now. So here's a kind of a summary of the problem. <laughs> I hope that it's helpful. Um, the obesity or just unhealthy body weight, if you will, uh, can contribute to a condition, uh, can contribute to what's called reactive oxygen species. So at a cellular level, you're sending out these signals that are challenging to the cells, okay? And over time, if you're in a, your body's unable to handle these uh, the stress, the chronic stress, it can create a state of redox imbalance and lead to oxidative stress, which is closely related to in enhanced inflammation at a systemic level, which can then contribute to increases in vascular inflammation at the cardiometabolic level and lead to tissue damage, chronic inflammation that we believe can accelerate the aging process. So with that, I want to give you a, a break. Because <laughs> I know that was a lot. <laughs> I, went, I know that we went through a lot, a lot. I tried my best to try to summarize kind of some of the key causes here, and I don't, um, I want to give you a break and just let you see this a woman. Uh, this is a photo of Helen Zeichmeister. Any idea of how old she is? Good guesses. Y'all are right on target. I heard 90. She's 91 years old. And she works out three times a week and can lift 200 pounds. So uh, hopefully that gets you better into a more uplifting state. <laughs> so the goal is not to say that all of this is um, inevitable. It's to say that we know there's factors that are contributing, and now we want to talk about what we can do about uh, these factors. OK. All right. So in the next part, I'm going to just 
go over broadly potential interventions uh, that are being considered, not by me specifically, but by the scientific community at large, by pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. So you may have heard of some of these, um, but um, because we now realize the connection between chronic inflammation and chronic disease states and functional decline, many, many companies, lots of interest around the world about potential interventions to avert inflammation. And I won't read all of these, but you can see at a pharmaceutical level some of them. These are the, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's a relatively comprehensive list um, of pharmaceuticals that are being considered at various stages of the um, development. Hormonal interventions at various stages of development. And in a second, I'll mention uh, the findings that we, we saw in our testosterone trial. Um, a variety of nutritional supplements are also under study. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the results of our review of the literature uh, at the end of potential nutritional compounds that may reduce chronic inflammation. Again, not an exhaustive list, but some, these, some of the key ones are there. And then, of course, um, my background passion in terms of lifestyle, behavior, and what role that, that has, which I think has the most important role, ultimately, uh, but also surgical interventions are in this mix um, because it can alter lifestyle behavior. Diet, um, meditation, yoga, tai chi, physical activity, which can mean a host of different things. And then related to that, here's kind of the model that we operate from at the Institute on Aging's um, Claude D. Pepper Older Americans Independence Center. So our ultimate goal is to um, enhance health and independence um, by t trying different approaches to enhance mobility and physical performance. Some of the key conditions that we believe contribute to uh, a reduction in mobility uh, is cognitive, cognitive decline, obesity, dynapenia. Anybody heard of dynapenia? Understand. Um, it's probably just something at our center. It's loss, <laughs> loss of muscle strength with age as opposed to sarcopenia, which is loss of muscle mass and, and also strength is tied in there. But this is loss of muscle strength without loss of muscle mass. And then chronic pain, which is more commonly known. Um, and then, of course, chronic disease conditions and aging itself can contribute to risk for these conditions. So at a behavioral level, the factors that we're looking at include over or undernutrition, sedentary lifestyle, sleep, medication usage, hospitalization, environmental stress. At a biological level, of course, inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, autophagy. Anybody heard of autophagy? OK, this is a good term to know and use at a party sometime. <laughs> it's the process through which your cells remove damaged particles or waste products. It's very important to overall health and, I believe, plays an important role in reducing chronic inflammation. DNA damage, more familiar, genetics, um, hormonal changes, neural degeneration. And then we, we're testing a host of, in, host of interventions ranging from pharmaceutical, hormonal, surgical, less so, nutraceutical, lifestyle, non-invasive brain stimulation, meditation, and cognitive training in conjunction with technologies which are becoming more and more part of our lifestyle interventions. Okay, at that, we'll give you one more break. Uh, so here's a role model for balance. Any ideas how old he is? 200. <laughs> this one. Um, you guys are good. It's a photo of Eleanor Heinemann. He is a karate black belt and is 90 years old as well. So pretty impressive balance at 90 years old. Okay. okay. So now we'll move into just a few of the key scientific findings uh, from our center and, and another center in as it relates to chronic inflammation. Okay. Um, and the, the first finding I want to show you is from uh, the pilot to the LIFE study. The LIFE study was the largest grant that UF, University of Florida Gainesville, had ever obtained to look at the effects of a comprehensive physical activity program 
in um, affecting risk for mobility disability. So for, could we ultimately reduce the likelihood that an older adult would develop a disability through this type of program? So this was the finding from the pilot study, which involved 400 older adults, 70 and older. And the reason this is so relevant is because here's this comp uh, marker IL-6. Okay, so the marker of chronic inflammation that's been directly associated with physical function. And so there's two conditions, the physical activity comprehensive exercise program three days a week, um, walking in com conjunction with resistance training and balance exercise. Or successful aging program where you would come to hear a talk like this uh, once a week, okay, uh, for a period of a year. And so over the course of the year, what we see is that the participants in the physical activity condition, uh, their uh, levels of IL-6 did not really change. If anything, they went down a little, but the participants in the successful aging had, a, had an increase that was statistically significant uh, higher than that of the physical activity group. So that's interesting. Um, but then the question is, okay, does that, mean anything in terms of risk for disability. Well, the, the larger study has now been conducted and, and was published in the journal of JAMA, one of the top journals. Um, and, and indeed, uh, over the course of, in this study, the participants followed a similar exercise program and were followed for, uh, over the course of approximately three years. And what you see here is that there was indeed a significant reduction in risk of developing disability, which was defined as inability to walk a block, okay? Uh, or persistent disability, which was defined as inability to walk a block on more than one occasion when they, were come back, when they came back to our center. So indeed, uh, this was a very important finding that for the first time showed that a, a lifestyle comprehensive exercise program could reduce the risk of developing a disability in an older adult who all participants at baseline did not have a disability. Okay. And so that, that was an important finding. Now, you might say, well, the reduction in inflammation was not that much that I just showed you. And, and in line with that, another study called the ADAPT trial looked at the effects of diet and exercise and the combination of diet and exercise in uh, overweight, um, women and men with uh, osteoarthritis, and, and also, again, measured IL-6. And what we see here is that diet really was the driving factor in reducing the level of IL-6 in the blood. Uh, the combination of diet and exercise was a little bit, uh, did result in a reduction, but not as much as the diet alone. And then you can see here a similar kind of result of, for the exercise program. Uh, that it kind of reduced levels a little, but not too much, where the control um, had a little bit of an elevation at 18 months. So this suggests that really the diet is the driver here of reducing levels of inflammation. Uh, and then uh, we also conducted a, a large multi-site uh, trial called the T-trial or the testosterone trial uh, with uh, 12 other sites around the country. Um, where we enrolled older men who were hypogonadal and uh, either were signed to receive testosterone or placebo, topically rubbed on the gel. And there was um, sub-studies within the main trial um, looking at the effects on sexual activity and function. And what did result was an uh, reported enhancement in desire and performance in men receiving testosterone. Um, in terms of walking ability, uh, it appears that there's an increase in terms of walking ability, but it wasn't statistically significant uh, at the whole trial level, which there was a 870 participants. Um, in the subset that had slow walking speed to begin with, they did statistically improve walking, so take that for what it is. And then um, in terms of changes in fatigue or mood states, there wasn't a statistically significant difference between testosterone and the placebo. Um, now, there's been a few follow-up trials uh, published in, in the journal JAMA. From the, this was published in New England Journal of Medicine, I think, in 2015. 
A few follow-up trials have recently been published if anybody's interested in, in, in the effects on cognitive function or uh, cardiovascular changes. I may get a question on that later, we'll see. Uh, now I'll give you one more break. Um, so this is an endurance role model. This is Ada Thomas. Any guesses on how old she is? 30? <laughs> okay. 82, okay. Somewhere between that. She first started to run at age 65 and ran her first marathon at the age of 69. Now, I'm not advising anybody to try to run for a marathon or train for a marathon or anything like that. I just want to highlight the human potential and the fact that somebody who didn't really run until the age of 65 was capable of running a marathon four years later, which is phenomenal to me. Again, I'm not advising running a marathon, but <laughs> it's great potential. Okay. Um, all right, the final section of the talk is something I haven't talked about yet, uh, but work that I'm really excited to present and, and work we've been um, doing for the past few years uh, on th in three separate study teams um, with the goal of answering three different questions. The first question is, what is the best diet for short-term and long-term weight loss? Now, I'm not gonna give you the perfect answer. I'm gonna tell you what the literature showed based on the criteria that we use to find studies, okay? Second question, what effects does intermittent fasting have on changes in body composition? Has anybody heard of intermittent fasting? Oh, good, okay. Uh, so we, so this, this has been published, this is under review. And number three, what effects do specific nutritional and pharmaceutical compounds have on chronic inflammation? This is gonna be presented for the first time in uh, Rome, Italy in December. So it's really being presented for the first time tonight, but, but don't tell anybody, okay? About, <laughs> and then hopefully we'll submit for publication soon. Uh, all right, so um, this was the, the, the first one. Uh, and what, here's the recently published title. You can see effects of popular diets without specific calorie targets on weight loss outcomes systematic review of findings from clinical trials. So this was my interest because, you know, everybody, not everybody, but many people ask me, what's the best diet? And I say, this is something I want to answer scientifically. And there's many, many diets out there, and many people say they have the perfect diet. So I said, well, let's look in the literature for um, what it says in regards to these diets that are being advocated by many individuals. So the first question was, well, how do we decide what list to use? So the, the way we did it was we took the diets that were listed as popular diets as listed in the 2016 U.S. News and World Report, and we looked at findings from clinical trials that examined their effects on short-term, which we defined as equal to or less than six months, and long-term, greater than or equal to one year, weight loss outcomes in individuals who are overweight or obese. Um, to, to then further refine this, there was a total of 38 popular diets that were listed, and 20 men are predefined criteria, primarily the criteria being that you, the diet could not have a specific calorie reduction part of it, okay? Because then we're getting into known uh, factors that produce weight loss. and so. So the question was, well, if you just follow this diet as they say and don't focus on reducing calories, will, will weight loss occur? Okay. So we then uh, narrowed down, okay, the, of the 20, how many actually had um, any evidence in the literature or from a clinical trial? And of those, only seven actually did. And those are the, the Atkins diet, the DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension, Glycemic index diet, Mediterranean diet, Ornish diet, Paleolithic, and Zone. Okay, and probably you've heard of these. If you haven't, I can explain more detail later. Um, and this is kind of the key. This is our figure. Uh, so this condenses a lot of work over a few years, but why not? Um, and so what you can see of the, of the various diets, in terms of on the, the figure on the left, shows the short-term weight changes. The figure on the right shows the long-term weight changes. 
you can see clearly that the Atkins diet actually is the diet that has the most research done on it of all the diets in terms of reported clinical trials, okay, in the literature where there was a baseline weight and a, and a clear weight loss outcome. Um, and you can see the range of weight losses here uh, for the various diets in terms of short-term outcomes, paleolithic there, vegan there, and zone diet here. Now, if anybody's familiar with the treatment of obesity, you know the real issue is can you produce long-term weight loss? So many, many trials have shown short-term weight loss of six months, but then followed by weight regain. And if anybody's tried to lose weight, I'm sh sure that's been a challenge over the long run because it's just very difficult to maintain weight loss. So we thought we would look at the long-term weight change. And again, you can just see the results with the Paleolithic diet showing one promising study the Ornish diet's showing less promise in, in terms of, um, these are kilograms, by the way, change in kilograms. The Mediterranean diet having two studies that, with only one really showing a clinically meaningful change in kilograms. And then the Atkins diet showing maybe four or five with um, a clinically meaningful change. Now, I'm not here to advocate the Atkins diet, I'm just trying to report what we found in the literature and we could talk about potential mechanisms, but, but it was of interest because in all these trials, the participants were not prescribed a reduction in calories. They were just told to follow these diets. Okay. All right, I'll move quickly because I know I'm moving towards my time limit. Um, okay, so the second question was, or the second area of research was, what effects does intermittent fasting have on body composition? And I know most people said you knew what intermittent fasting was, but just to be clear, what we're referring to is, it can, it's a term that can describe a variety of eating patterns in which no or, or few calories are consumed for time periods that generally range from 12 hours to several days on a recurring basis, okay? So for this purpose, I'm gonna show you figures from two types of intermittent fasting regimens. The first type is time-restricted feeding, which means that um, you're only eating um, for a time period that is, um, I'm sorry, you're, you're fasting for a time period that's greater than 12 hours but less than 24 hours, so you're not eating. Uh, an alternate day fasting, which would be what it says, with the note that in seven of the, or eight of the nine trials that we're gonna present, it was alternate day modified fasting, which meant on, on the day that they were, quote, fasting, they were allowed to consume 500 calories or less in the afternoon, so it's not truly alternate day fasting. Okay, so this is the time-restricted feeding. Now, I realize this is way small font, and I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, the goal here is just to highlight these red boxes, which mean, and this column, which is change in body fat, okay? So two of the four trials showed a significant reduction in, in body fat. Um, so, the, which meant two of the four did not show a significant reduction. And if these same two trials also showed a redu significant reduction in body weight when individuals followed the time-restricted feeding and no other um, specific um, intervention included. Okay, so that's one. Now, the, you're probably not underwhelmed by that. The good news is there was a lot more research on the alternate day modified fasting program and I did this long red box because why? Because every study showed significant reductions in body fat uh, from this approach. Um, and two of them show, two of the nine showed lean, lean mass was reduced, but significantly, but that means that in many of the other trials, lean mass was not significantly reduced. So the, the effect on lean mass is less clear, but what is clear is the effect on weight loss on this column and body fat was pretty consistently shown from this alternate day modified fasting approach. Now, take that for what it's worth in terms of whether or not you want to try it, but it, it certainly was pretty effective from a, a, a fat loss standpoint. Um, and then the last area to cover is uh, what I mentioned, where this is the newest area that we're, we're looking to, to venture into in, in terms of presenting the findings um, and the effects of nutritional and pharmacological interventions targeting chronic low-grade inflammation. And we did a systematic review and meta-analysis. And in order to pick the interventions, because as I showed you earlier, there's many to consider. 
we tried to use some key criteria, which are the safety. Did it have a good safety record? Was there any evidence to suggest it could reduce IL-6 or CR CRP? Any evidence to suggest that uh, these compounds are associated with physical performance? Was there a clear mechanism? Uh, the innovation is less re relevant here, and is it practical, affordable for the consumer? So using that criteria, which is something that could be debated, uh, we came up with uh, six uh, potential uh, compounds, and, and we looked at over or, well, 858 studies to be specific, where we use various search terms for these different compounds. And in this column, you can see the number of studies that we included in the review out of a total of so many potential trials that were excluded for one reason or another because they didn't meet our criteria. So in, in most cases, these, these compounds, these angiotensin receptor blockers had seven. Metformin, a popular drug for diabetes, had seven clinical trials. Omega-3 had the most, 16. Probiotics had five clinical trials. Resveratrol, people have heard of resveratrol? OK. And vitamin D had 10. So now I'll just show you in two more slides the key findings. Um, so this shows you the mean effect, mean decrease in IL-6 by compound. So what you see here is that three of the six, now metformin is not listed on this slide. Why? Because there's actually no trial that we could identify that looked at the effects of metformin on IL-6 levels, okay? So here you only see five compounds. So, so, but three of the six potential compounds showed significant effects in reducing this inflammatory cytokine that we know has an important role in uh, relationship with physical function, with the probiotics showing the largest decrease here, but significant reductions by omega-3 fatty acids and angiotensin receptor blockers. The effects of resveratrol and, and vitamin D, although in the right direction, were relatively small. Okay. And then we also looked at C-reactive protein. Okay and what effect these different compounds had here. And again, the uh, ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers, had a significant reduction. Um, metformin came in, in this case, had a significant reduction. Omega-3 fatty acids, again, and probiotics, again, had, uh, were associated with significant reductions in this inflammatory marker. Resveratrol, although it looks like it would be significant, in some studies, the, the direction was not always negative, so it wasn't a significant finding. And same thing for vitamin D here. So with that, I will summarize the kind of the, the main point of these talk, the talks is that there's a growing body of evidence to indicate that chronic systemic inflammation contributes to age-related uh, decline in function and can increase risk of morbidity and mortality. Emerging evidence supports the potential of some nutritional and pharmaceutical compounds to reduce systemic inflammation in middle-aged and older adults. The ones that we found specifically that in our review were angiotensin receptor blockers, omega-3 fatty acids, probiotics, and metformin. Um, so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Am I on? Oh. Thank you. And I'm going to go back here, and Christy's going to come up front, and we will take questions for a bit. We're in charge. Oh, I'm in charge. OK, I saw his hand first. I saw his hand over there first. I'm sorry. You said I was in Be careful what you wish for. Thank you. You refer quite often to the IL-6. And I'm wondering if mainstream uh, medicine, your GP, is testing for this with an annual blood test? And is there a number you want to hit on the C-reactive protein? A very good question. Um, to my knowledge, and I'm not a, a physician, but I, uh, from the individuals I've interacted with, it's not a standard part of the uh, test. It, it can be done. Uh, typically, the C-reactive protein, the one that most everybody was familiar with, is, is more frequently being measured. If you wanted to have your IL-6 levels measured, the level, I think that's what you were asking, was what, what level would you want to, and based on the, the studies that I showed earlier, uh, and most trials to date, 
It's not a magic number, but this level of 2.5 uh, seems to, um, and we can talk about the, the actual, because there's complicated ways of analyzing it, uh, but I think most people use it in picograms over milliliters, so 2.5 is the magic level that we've kind of used in our studies in terms of enrolling participants to say if they have chronic inflammation or not. So I hope that's helpful. I see back there. Oh, I guess she's. Have you considered or have you all looked at the possibility of the uh, magnetic wave systems like the Beamer? Are you familiar with the Beamer or any of those sorts of things that they claim that it increases circulation, which really reduces inflammation by significant amounts? I have to be honest, I, I'm not familiar with this Beamer system. I do understand the premise, though, that potentially by increasing circulation, that can in turn result in a reduction in, of inflammation by virtue of clearing out some of the inflammatory cytokines from the bloodstream. So um, I'd like to learn more about that, the Beamer. Yeah. Uh, I saw somebody read. Uh... Oh, one. Sorry. On the probiotics, uh, is there any indication, or I'm curious about the mechanism of action, is it, you know, uh, bacterium producing anti-inflammatory compounds, or is the body responding to the bacteria in an anti-inflammatory way? It's a very good question and, and not easy to answer because we all have microbiota, so we all have these uh, microorganisms within us. The probiotics are supposedly the good, healthy microorganisms that can modulate a number of factors in the body, ranging from immune function to response to infection. And the specific mechanism, I think, is not clearly known, but the role of the microbiota in health and disease is becoming much more of interest. Um, and it's a very complicated area to try to understand. One other quick question. On the intermittent fasting, are the beneficial effects due to total caloric reduction, or is it due to some of the compounds that are, you know, the body produces like beta-hydroxybutyrate or acetoacetate? Which, which, which is it, really? It's a great question. Um, in the review article, we, we titled it Flipping the Metabolic Switch, and the idea was that if you can flip this, uh, the you, fuel source that your body uses from glucose predominantly to the ketones you mentioned, uh, that that can have many beneficial effects, including reducing oxidative stress levels and inflammation, and enhancing autophagy, that cellular cleaning process I mentioned. So I think that alone has profound beneficial effects. It could also be the fact that most people, when they do engage in intermittent fasting, find it hard to consume enough food on the days when they're eating to make up for the difference when they're fasting. So it makes it hard to say for sure, but I do think there's an independent effect. Yeah. Uh, I saw that. All right, well, okay. And then we'll go. I need a simple answer. Simple answer, okay. Uh, I'll try. <laughs> what, what is the best way that I can find out whether or not I have systemic uh, inflammation? I, I would recommend the blood test and ask for C-reactive protein and IL-6 and, and look at the levels. The C-reactive protein, um, generally, if it's over two, it would start to be considered elevated. And the IL-6, I mentioned, of 2.5. That would be the best way I know. Um, I think he was first, and then, the, yeah, the one in the back. I'm sorry. So a, a lot of what you've shown up here has been epidemiological or correlative type work, and I'm not sure that that necessarily translates into causation. So is there, is there a body of evidence anywhere that you're aware of that says if you reduce your IL-6 levels or if you reduce your CRP levels, that's gonna give you a longer, more meaningful life? <laughs> not in humans. There's not a clear uh, lifespan connection between reduction in um, those levels in humans and longer life. In animal studies, there are, and, and in terms of the animals that have lived longest have those, the, the factors that I discussed. Uh, and just as a side note, the, the review I presented were 
were, were reviews of clinical trials. So they were summaries of clinical trials rather than epidemiological evidence. Just to, yeah. Uh, he had a question. I think eventually, ultimately, all of our questions are going to be about living a better quality life. I understand. For That's our goal. Yeah. I understand. So in, in, in lay terms, can, can you talk very briefly about the benefits or the, 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 or the liabilities of like testosterone therapy as you grow older? Because when you're young, you're strong, you're powerful. As you get older, you're not because you lose testosterone. If you jack yourself up with that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I can um, mention what I, I, I mentioned, which was we, in that study what we, what we found. There were some beneficial effects clearly related to the sexual function and potentially physical function. At the same time, um, and these studies were recently published in JAMA, there was uh, more calcium deposits in the arteries of the individuals taking the testosterone in our study. Um, the cognitive function wasn't necessarily changed. Um, so uh, it's unfortunately not crystal clear what the final answer is related to that. Um, what is something to consider, and I, I'm a kind of a proponent of this intermittent fasting at the moment, is, is that it tends to increase uh, endogenous production of hormones such as growth hormone and testosterone. So that may be an a, approach to consider. Um, on the other hand, if you're not a fan of that idea, th the best thing I can say is to weigh the evidence and make your own decision. What about These are the things that we're, we're looking into. I don't know of a study that has shown uh, exogenous testosterone and cancer uh, uh, increased incidence. Um, it's a good question, though. I wish I had a more definite answer for you. The term probiotics covers a, a world of territory. Is there a list of the specific cultures that were involved with the probiotics in that study? Good question, and I agree that it's covering a huge territory. Uh, what, what I presented was, um, if I remember correctly, it was seven studies that qualified for the probiotics, so each one may have used a slightly different formulation. Uh, what we could do is, you know, try to report that in an appendix, what the specific strains were. Uh, the reason I wanted to do the review was in part because of a question like that, because it could be that there's only one particular strain that's showing a, a, an effect, or is it just if you're taking this type of uh, supplement that it has a beneficial effect regardless of the specific strain. What we saw was, as you saw in the slide, the probiotics had the the largest reduction in those markers. So I don't have a brand to recommend, unfortunately. Uh, she said. Guys, we, we have time for two more two questions. More? Okay. This one and one last. Okay. So the angiotensin receptor blockers, do they not also affect your blood pressure? They very well do. Yeah, so they reduce it. Correct. So, you know, what if you have inflammation, but you don't have high blood pressure? Would you still take it? Well, let me preface, I'm not here to recommend any of this. I'm here to show you the evidence. And, and what you saw was, was, was that. So now, having said that, as you could see from those slides, there was other potential approaches that you could take if your goal was to reduce inflammation, besides the angiotensin receptor blocker. If you had a high blood pressure and, and you were also concerned about inflammation, it may be something good to talk with your doctor about uh, in terms of those, those specific compounds, yeah. Oh. Somebody else should pick. All right, all right. <laughs> you spoke uh, very well of intermittent fasting, and you described it as fasting 12 out of the 24 hours. I describe that as a, a type of intermittent type, fasting, right. which is called time-restricted feeding, just to clarify. Okay. There is another intermittent fasting diet that I think is very popular. People talk about, I think it's intermittent fasting. It's uh, 500 calories two days a week and eat normally the rest. 
Could you give us uh, your verdict on that? Um, it, it is a type of intermittent fasting, and the, and the trials that we looked at had some generally positive effects. We didn't include them in, in our review because I considered that more periodic fasting um, is very debatable. It could have been included in the review. The reviewers may come back and say, you need to include that in your review because it is a popular approach of two days a week restricting calories and then the other five days eating as you prefer. It, it, at the end of the day, the two things I want to leave you, I think, what's the best exercise program? You ready for this? It's the one you will do. <laughs> what's the best dietary program? It's the one you will do. So keep that in mind. That's my answer to you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. If you all could